Well, thank you. Even though these biology books are full of unsubstantiated dogmatic statements supporting evolution, there are still two major reasons why you should adopt these books. First, by so doing, you will strike the final blow to the teaching of evolution. There are some hidden jewels in these texts just waiting to be mined by inquisitive students that can destroy evolution. In 2009, when the board adopted these new science standards, the evolutionists were painted into a corner. The authors were required to provide scientific evidence for explanations of the sudden appearance and stasis of groups in the fossil record and the complexity of the cell, and most importantly, to identify the specific pages where they were to do so. These sections are the hidden jewels. In the following week, American Association for the Advancement of Science reported new science standards for Texas schools strike a major blow to the teaching of evolution. The adoption of these books represents the final blow because despite their boastful, boastful assertions of robust evidence for evolution, when you actually read those identified sections, the hidden jewels, you will find the evidence incredibly weak to non-existent. And if there's no evidence, there's no evolution. Science, test explanations, classically with controlled experiments and historically by collecting evidence. Genetics is an excellent example of classical testability. Mendel, in 1865, after growing 29,000 pea plants empirically deduced the laws of inheritance. Continental drift is an excellent example of historical testability. The obvious fit of the coastlines of Africa and South America, similar geologic formations, discovery of the mid-Atlantic ridge and sea force spreading make a convincing argument. Likewise, evolution is tested historically. Evolutionists need a lot of evidence. How much? Simply they must provide the, enough to explain the origin of everything else in the book. Here's one book's index, 4,000 items. Here is one item, biochemical complexity. How much evidence do the authors provide? They just wave their magic wand of words and come up with some simple explanations. That just so stories. The second reason I ask you to adopt these books is because they happen consistently to, I mean, coincidentally to support what the Bible says. The Bible says God created all life after their kind. What we see in the world around us supports what the Bible says. We see a myriads of things that, that replicate themselves and can be organized into distinct uh, classifications. Dr. McElroy, go ahead and finish since you were a former board member. We'll let you finish. Well, I only got about 20 seconds. That's true. <laughs> Not only does, okay. What we see in the world around us supports what the Bible says. But what we see in these books supports what the Bible says. Test it for yourself. Open it random any page and ask yourself if the description and illustration you find supports the claims of the Bible or of evolution. Even the units on evolution support what the Bible says because as demonstrated they don't even support evolution. Ironically, evolutionists argue that creationists want to force their religious views in the text but just the teaching of biology does that and teaching evolution demonstrates that's not how God did it. Since true testable science trumps dogmatism, strike the final blow to the teaching of evolution, support the Bible, and adopt these books. Thank you. Which books are you talking about? All of them. Uh, if you look on the reverse side of the page, or that first page I gave you, those are the areas of the main publishers, areas that have to deal with sudden appearance and stasis and the complexity of the cell. I want you to adopt these books because if you read those sections, those pages, they have to at least give a hint to the origin of everything else in the biology book. And they're weak. You test things in science. We, we have a definition of science that was also included in our new standards. It said science is the use of evidence to make testable explanations. You test it two ways in science. Historically, it's the way you test evolution. You cannot evolve something in a lab. I mean, you can claims and stuff, but you don't evolve a new cat or something like that in the lab. You're going to have to look at the historical evidence. We have identified, those are the hidden jewels in our books. Read those pages. I've read them. They're weak. In, in, in the fossil record, they talk about sudden appearance and stasis, where they try to, to explain it. One publisher doesn't even deal with it. They ignore it in their 50% rule. But the ones that do talk about punctuated equilibrium. Well, that was an idea to try to get around the idea that the fossil record does not support evolution. And then if you look at the complexity of the cell, they talk about one cell swallows another cell and somehow acquires the, uh, that cell that gets swallowed up then becomes a chloroplast, becomes a nucleus, becomes a mitochondria. That's weak. They have no evidence of how it did it. And on that chart that I had displayed, I read, I read evolutionist books. This Jerry Coyne in Why Evolution is True, in trying to explain biochemical complexity, this is a book he wrote just two years ago 
about the evidence for evolution, and all you see in there is he says there was a common ancestor of fibrinogen. One little word on that entire 29, uh, 27 square foot chart. He highlights one molecule, fibrinogen, the, uh, common, an imaginary common ancestor of a sea cucumber and all us vertebrates, you know, all of us with backbones. Okay, Mrs. Knight, did you have a, did that answer your question? That's weak. Well, no. Let the students <laughs> see how weak it is. What was your question? No, okay. I know your question. Let the for little, the, no, go ahead. For the uh, book, some of the hidden jewels, and you've got the publishers, the three publishers, are you saying adopt these books facetiously? No, no. These are the ones that address No, if, if you look at the other part of the handout, I gave you two articles from Science Magazine. Okay. Right after we passed these standards four and a half years ago. Uh -huh. When we passed these standards, there was a new story that said, and this is the Triple AS, American Association for Advancement of Science. It's their top science journal and weekly journal in the world, one of the top. You can't get much better than this. In their new story, they said, new science standards for Texas schools strike a major blow to the teaching of evolution. Two weeks later, they interviewed me and one of the authors of the book, and they ran another second story. And in that story, the evolutionists predicted, oh, this has a chance for us to show the robustness of evolutionary theory. I predicted, I can't wait for these books to come out. I've been waiting for four and a half years. It's four and a half years later, the books are out. Let the students, the inquisitive students, the ones that are not blind, look at the evidence in these books. They don't even give a hint to explain the complexity. They have to explain the origin of everything else in the book. This is awesome. Let's get these books to the kids. Let them see it. Let that little young student in the classroom say, is this all the evidence that they can give? Maybe, maybe, that's why I think it'll strike a major blow to teach you the evolution, and this could be the final blow. I'm, I'm really, I'm excited. Put those books in there. I don't like the dogmatism of, about the books, but I like the fact that we've exposed, we've painted them into a corner, and they have no evidence in those books to support evolution. Stop them. Okay, other... I'm serious. Other questions? I'll, uh, yes, Mr. Ratliff. <laughs> I'm always nice. Okay, I just, I want to make sure... I understand your argument, and that promise this isn't a long question. You want us to adopt the books because you believe that the books lack evidence, therefore the books prove that evolution doesn't exist? I think what we want to do is have our students, using science, if they go to the part of the, uh, they understand the definition of science, which is in all our new high school science books, it's the use of evidence to make testable explanations, once they understand what historical science is, like that you show continental drift, one simple separation with four facts. Well, how many facts do you need to show evolution? I, I, I mean, it's, it's in the billions and trillions and trillions. Well, there should be, at least in those sections, to explain it, that, that should be there. But they're not there. And so I'm just hoping a young creationist, uh, Thomas, you know, young Thomas Ratliff, that's a creationist, God will sit us. there and say, look, is this all the evidence they have? Well, maybe God didn't use evolution to do it. Okay, let me ask you another question. In the, the AAAS science journal that you mentioned, the new science standards for Texas schools strike a major blow to the teaching of evolution. Isn't that a different statement than strikes a major blow to evolution? Of course. So the standard striking a blow as to what, how it is taught is different than the scientific journal saying that evolution has had a major blow dealt to it. Well... Yeah, but it's, I'll take either one, whatever words that guy Okay, because it, it, it seemed as though you were implying that the Journal of Science was saying well, that I think evolution we can. Is... Okay, let's stick to the books since yeah, we're yeah, here to talk fine. about no. the textbooks instead of a journal. Okay, okay. So, well, anyway. The, uh, so your, your position is that these books prove that evolution doesn't happen and you want us to adopt them? No. That's what, I did not say prove. I just say the evidence is weak. Okay, thank you. I don't prove anything. I may be wrong. Okay, any other questions? All right. Thank you, Dr. McElroy. Thanks. Thank you all.